during this episode we will visit Alberta, one of the three prairie provinces. As all the other provinces and territories, it's super big, with 700,000 square kilometers and 16 times as big as the Netherlands, which is for me, as a Dutchman, an incredible amount of space. And yes, Alberta has it all. Lots of wildlife, beautiful lakes, high mountains, lots of prairies, but today we will focus on horses. And you got it, we gonna paint a horse. My name is Michael Schutte and thank you for watching Painting the Island. Hello and welcome in my studio. Today we are in Alberta where it's freezing cold, but there are lots of horses. So I thought, let's paint a horse today. Let's have some fun and at work. Yes, we're gonna create a cold environment, but we will start as a contrast with a warm tone of yellow ochre and a lysan crimson and some titanium white. We can use the big one inch brush for that and with small crisscross strokes we go over the full width of the canvas. With this technique the paint goes easier into the gesso or cotton surface of the canvas and makes a beautiful gradient in your evening or morning sky. Actually it works like this. First we push the paint into the canvas and then with a very light stroke, almost petting, we blend it softly out. Keep in mind whenever you take a photograph, always do it early in the morning or in the early evening, like I mentioned before, as these times will give you the most interesting shadows and light combinations. So never use afternoon or even worse, noon light, it's just not interesting. Then with light and dark bluish grey tones we will make a cold cold sky. Nothing special, it's more mist than clouds. We push the light grey down into the ochre layer and this is the right technique to create a fantastic gradient. Actually there won't be much left visible of the ochre tones but it will give that secret backlight peeping to the trees and snow. In this part of the painting we will do a few tiny little clouds first with light grey and then a sneaking in dark depression from the right side. Really nothing special, it's just an impression. Then we blend it in with the same one inch brush and that will work all fine. Those big one inch brushes from Uncle Bob work really fine and they are indestructible. I think I bought this one 30 years ago in Amsterdam and it still works great. Then we can create a very far away number of trees with a fan brush. The trick is that we put a dark and a light grey on this brush on both sides and then with little crisscross strokes we carefully create a far away background forest. With a one inch brush we can fade it out and so we get a far away misty background. And at the other side of the horse we can do the same. Little crisscross moves will create the illusion of a far away forest disappearing into the mist. Use some different greys and don't push too hard. And very important, use some different sizes of trees. And we don't make too much work of it as this is only background. With the same one inch brush we can do the amount of mist like we did before and we can attach a bit of phthalo blue mix to it to create a cold atmosphere. Then with a very light touch we can create a few upstanding grasses very roughly with a darker grey. As the horse is pretty light we have to create more, a more darker background. Let's call it creating a contrast. With a darker grey 
and a touch of the phthalo blue we can do this. Snow can be a painter's trap, so keep in mind that snow is not white. Snow is a frozen water cell, and like millions of crystals of, or mirrors, it reflects its surrounding. As this is a starting sunset, the snow will reflect the grays, the purples, the light tones, which can be a very tricky technique. For now we keep it a bit dark, but later, when it's dry, we can play with light and shadow tones. A bit tricky is the part between the legs, but also here we have to make the snow field uneven and maybe muddy. We try to keep the lines, and yes, as drawing a horse is pretty complicated, I did this off camera on my ears, and I covered the sketch with English red. This strong pigment will lock up the greasy graphite of the pencil, and as you do the painting for the second time, you will notice little mistakes. We keep on going creating a background in the snow, which is pretty dark and muddy, to get a contrast for the body, the tail and later for the up-throwing snow caused by the hooves of the running horse. For now, we cover the canvas as soon as possible. Let it dry for a couple of days and then we do the finishing touch. Before we're gonna paint the horse, it might be a good idea to create a few background props, like a tree, maybe some bushes, well we shall see. Let's start with a tree here in the corner, we draw a very thin line where the tree trunk will rise out of the snow, and I always use a bit of black and burnt shanna for the tree trunks. Slowly we make it bigger and bigger, till we think it's big and long enough. And maybe we can do another one in the back, and then we use a bit of grey to make it look further away. With a small round brush we can paint lots of branches. And from this point I speed up the video, otherwise you will fall asleep, but it's still easy to follow. The trick is with branches, no pressure at the end of the branch, so simple is it. And take your time, no rush, and let the branches grow. And use your fantasy. Take a good look outside how trees are built up and how branches grow. I painted a lot of trees in my life, but I still enjoy to sit down in a forest, pick a cool tree and start sketching. This is always very relaxing for the mind, and it doesn't have to be a masterpiece, but it's an excellent way for development of the eye-hand coordination. With a knife I scratched some snow into the wet tree trunk, and it gives a pretty realistic look. I admit it's not an easy technique, but if you ever need help, you are always welcome in our beautiful lesson center in Qualicum Beach, no worries. With a small round brush, we can decorate the branches with the lightest snow color. You lean your hand on the stick that takes the pressure away and lay the snow up on the branches and so easy is it. Uncle Bob would have said, let's give these trees a little friend, so let's do that. A friendly little Christmas tree is easy to do with a very dark tone, almost no color, because it's more a silhouette. Make it uneven, not too manicured, and down below it gets a bit of shadow, more mud. Then we can decorate it with a snow tone. It's a bit tricky because it's so very wet, but the snow will nicely melt away into the dark as a kind of shadow. When the tree is dry, we can give it more highlights. But we need some shadow here as a contrast for the tail, so we keep it dark. We can try a few highlights, but we better stop now, it's getting too muddy. Let's fade it out a bit and let's see what we can paint at the other side of the horse. Maybe it's nice to have an old fence here in the corner. 
The underlayer is still a bit wet, but we can paint a base for a fence already. We use a small round brush and a dark tone of black and burnt sienna. And we try to create a kind of perspective when we paint the last few poles a bit smaller and a bit more grayish. I let the paint dry for a few days and then I went over the poles one more time with the same dark tone of burnt sienna and black. On the left side we can make it a bit darker and make the left pole a bit sturdier too. And then with the snow color we can slowly add some snow and I will do this on the right side of the poles. Now it might be a bit too wet but at least we can give it a bit of snow. Later we can always come back to give it some more. For now we paint very carefully with a small round brush some light snow. It's time for the break. Let's talk about Alberta. Named after Princess Louise Caroline Alberta, the fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. Now painters, watch this portrait. In my eyes, an absolute masterpiece. The light, the color, the position. As a teacher, I would give this painting a big A or a 10 as we do in Holland. Beside the colors, look at the pearls and the gold jewelry. You can read the character of this lady. Astrocratic, cool, determined and a gorgeous beauty. Now I have to stop because this is all about the province of Alberta and not about the princess. Alberta has it all, I said it before. And let's start with the lakes. Number one is Lake Louise. Yes, named after the same princess and the colors are fantastic. But I must say my absolute favorite is Moraine Lake. My wife Els and I did a lot of canoeing over there and it's like stepping back in time to the Jurassic Park. Yes, after every turn with the canoe I expected a dinosaur roaring between the ancient rocks. Your teacher has a weird fantasy, never mind. Later when we walked the path along the lake we saw fresh tracks of a couple of beers. So as fast as we could we went back to our starting point. Sorry, but we Dutch are not prepared for a meeting with these fluffy guys. And there is Malinje Lake. I painted this scene with my students already thousand times. And it's called Spirit Island. We were there three times and three times it rained cats and dogs as they say here in Canada. Well, in Holland we say you get what you deserve. To reach this viewpoint above Lake Peto in Banff National Park you have to climb a little bit but on the average the path is pretty easy. The reward is an astonishing view over this lake shaped by ancient volcanoes. And of course there is wildlife. Certainly in Banff National Park there is a crowd of bears, so many that the campground needed an electrical fence to protect the campers. Yes, the mothers watch the babies and raise them well. So when you do a hike over there remember you walk through a zoo without bars. And you are not looking at the animals, no, the animals are observing you. Considering if you might be their next dinner for tonight. And it's so convenient for them when you carry a beer bell, which you can buy in all the local souvenir shops. Then all the animals know, hey guys, it's dinner time, let's check them out. So for now, let's stick to the horses and don't mind me with my stupid jokes. If you don't bother wildlife and you pay good attention, you will survive, don't you worry. Now let's go back to our painting. And yes, we gonna paint the horse, finally. I know you are eager to see the horse, but as I am an old school painter, I always start from the back to the front. And the horse stands at the front, it is like it is. First of all, let's repair the outlines of the head. I made a sturdy sketch with English red, but during the background painting it can be a bit damaged. 
Usually I always start with the head. If the head is good, then the rest of the horse or any other animal will be alright too. And when the outline is okay again, the best we can do is the darker parts and shadows. At the start it might look a bit weird and unreal, but when we get to the blending it will all come together. I found it a nice challenge to paint a white horse in opposite of a snowy background. We will see if that will work. After all, the snow is not really white and the horse is light but not completely white. The same. You will see what I mean. His neck hairs are waving in the wind and pretty light, but there is a shadow too. With a darker grey mixed in the dark ochre tones, we can paint some darker parts starting in the neck and waving out into the light. For the light, we use a very light ochre tone and at the end we will add more highlights. The horse is making up speed, so the neck hairs are waving high in the wind, which makes it pretty attractive for us painters. But for now, it's getting too muddy, so we leave it drying for a couple of days and then we will add more highlights. First of all, we're going to work on the face, and this might look strange at the start because his face is in the shadow. So we work first with different tones of grey, and we can touch a tiny bit of purple to the mix. After all we are in a late afternoon, almost sunset early evening mode, so a bit of purple is ok, not too much. But like I told you, in the beginning it will look weird. Then we use a light ochre tone for this cheek and fade this slowly into the grey in his face and then you will see that it all comes together. Working in layers needs some patience. I understand that everybody wants to see the end result right away, but that is not gonna happen. The big secret of the Dutch masters is and was that they always worked in layers. So after two, three or even more layers, they got the final result, which nobody in the world in those days could do or even understand. The big masters of layering were Rembrandt, Rijn, Johannes Vermeer, Jan van Gooyen and, and way much more. You know what, you can do an online tour through the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It's easy, just log in and I guarantee you a great tour. No, no people standing before you, no bullet free thick glass plates before the paintings, which I hate, but ok, it seems to be necessary nowadays. No, it's just you and the painting, which you can study in all rest and peace, and as long as you want. In the meantime, we are making the shadows deeper and the light points lighter. Under his eye, there is a black spot, which is charming, but a bit nasty to do. His eyes are dark, with a touch of burnt shanna. Later, we will put a light in. And the nose is pretty dark, almost black. We paint the front head roughly with some shadow and light colors. And now it's all starting to come alive. And like I mentioned, the nose is very black. So we give the nostrils or holes a very thin outline. Behind the cheek we can make it pretty dark with a dark grey. We still have to do a bit more extra dark on his dark spot under the eye. Just as the nose and then with a soft blender we can all blend it in nicely. His breast part is in a shadow too, so we first make it greyish and then try to follow his muscles and bones as good as we can. We can do the lighter spots with a combination of light ochre and a very light grey. And then with a soft blender we can blend it all in. Yeah, horses are not easy and if you want to do more it might be good to do some drawing and sketching studies of horses. It's a complicated bone structure and he has got a lot of muscles. 
And as we're talking about a horse, where does the Canadian horse come from? Who knows? Well, here is some history. In the year 1665, the French king, Louis XIV, sent two stallions and 20 mares from his royal stables situated in Normandy and Brittany, the center of the royal horse breeding in those days. The ship, however, was hit big by a severe storm and only 12 mares survived the trip. Two more shipments followed in 1667 and 1670. These shipments included a mix of draft horses and light horses, which included both pacing and trotting horses. Honestly, I don't know the difference, but the horse riding in crowd among you will absolutely know what I'm talking about. I did some horse riding in the very, very past about 100 years ago, and I must say it was a very pleasant experience riding through the beautiful dunes in Holland. It seems like you become one with the rhythm of the horse, and the slow pace is wonderful. Until one horse of the group I was riding with didn't like my horse. And before I could do anything, my horse was in a fight with me still on his back. I think I told this before a long time ago. In a fraction, I saw a hoof kicking my horse just a few centimeters of next of my knee. And I thought, oops, horse riding might be too tricky for me. Lucky enough, the leader of the group could stop the fight and I was saved. And I didn't fall off. But it was definitely the end of my horse riding career. I was performing almost every day in those days in different famous bands. And I had to stand for more than 8 or sometimes 10, 12 hours a day or night. So I needed my two legs more than ever. So this was a bit of history how the horse came to Canada. And of course there's lots of more stories to tell, but you can read it all by yourself on Wikipedia. It's very interesting. Actually the modern Canadian horse is dark and pretty sturdy. But we are painting against all odds a light horse. Well, what does it matter? As long as we're having fun, everything is okay. In the meantime I painted his belly dark with a backlight of an ochre tone. And I will explain this after the break. Before we say goodbye, I would like to show you our Academy of Music and Art in Qualicum Beach. I teach their music and art and my wife Els card making and scrapbooking. I would love to show you my paintings just to get some inspiration. And I understand that for a lot of you Qualicum Beach is not next door, but if you happen to be on Vancouver Island, just hop in for a chat and take a look around. And of course you are always welcome if you need some advice about materials, maybe color mixing or whatever you want to know about art and music. My sweet wife Els is a magician with paper and she shows a great selection of scrapbooking and paper art. And don't forget that we offer a wide range of causes in music, painting, scrapbooking and card making. Yes, there is a whole new world, a whole new creative world for you right at your fingertips. Our steady viewers might know by now that I love to support the North Island Wildlife Recovery Center in Arrington with my paintings. This place, founded by Sylvia and Robin Campbell, is a lovely retreat for wounded birds and other animals who need recovery and help. Also a lovely place for inspiration. So if you ever visit the island, take a look in the center and admire all the wonders of nature. Enjoy! After the belly we will paint the legs, which is always the hardest part of the horse. We start with the shadow parts 
and just follow the outlines and fill the dark spaces. And actually, that's it. But how do we get a round leg? Well, with the, with the light ochre tones, we can paint a backlight at the sides and then blend it softly into the dark. And that will result into a round shaped leg. And after the blending, we start with the left leg, which is a bit lighter. So we use a lighter mix of gray and ochre, but in fact, we do the same technique to get the leg round. Blending in is the magic word. And the part of the hoof is always a challenge. It get a bit of burnt sienna and dark gray and then softly blend it in. Now when a horse is in full action like this one, running through the snow, having fun, all the muzzles are full of tension. And you can see that this wild horse is re really having fun, like I said. Some animals are getting totally crazy when they see the first snow. Pay attention to your own dog. When he sees for the first time in his life snow, you let him loose in the garden. Dogs, horses, deer, bears, they all like to play in the fresh snow. Just like kids, they play, they dive, they slip, and having the time of their life. I don't know about pussy cats, by the way. I think a domestic cat finds it too cold and wet. Anyway, when we paint a full run like this, we have to pay attention to the muzzles. So we try to follow the move of the leg muscles as good as we can using dark and light and keep on blending with soft round strokes. So we try to paint the muscles as good as we can, like I said, using dark and light and keep on blending with soft round brush strokes. And it might not hurt to take a good look at photographs. Get as much reference photos as, as you can. Go to Google Pictures, download and print them and take a good look at it. And believe me, reference photos are the most important thing to have when you paint horses. It's safe to paint first the outline from the front leg because it's the eye catcher of the horse, then some dark gray and then we do the same technique as we did the other legs. We use gray and a light ochre tone combined with a very light gray. When it's all dry, we always can cheer it up with a bit of a highlight. And the hoof gets the same color, a bit of ochre with some burnt sienna and a dark gray in the shadow part. We let the legs dry for now and before we forget it, this guy has a ponytail and he is huge. We start with a foundation of ochre and gray tones, the same as the horse, and we make it pretty big. We have to consider that this is not a neat, groomed tail of a stable stallion. It's probably dirty, muddy, loaded with moist and snow and other stuff, but it's waving in the wind and the upper part is catching the sun, so it needs a lot of highlight. It will cover a bit of the trees behind it, but the highlight will exactly fall in the dark shadow part of the tree. And this is what I had in mind to create a contrast. Small round brush, we can paint some highlights in the wet background colors. And take care that it's all pretty wiggly, but I think it's getting too muddy for now. So we better blend it in with a soft round blender and wait till it's dry and then do the finishing touch. Of all the hair techniques, this is the very best. We set it up roughly, go in with small hairs and blend it in. Then when it's dry, we paint all the small hairs again, blend it in and maybe repeat this technique a few times more. And I know it needs a lot of patience, but at the end, it is very rewarding. I think we leave the tail alone now for a while and let it dry. We need to do some more work on the poles on the left side. 
With a small round brush we can decorate these poles with a phthalo blue snow color, very very light. And maybe a bit of grey in a shadow. It's always fun to decorate those props and they are really important in your painting to make it more lively. In the front and behind the poles we can cheer it up with some light grasses and a few parts of fresh fallen snow. You can make up all kinds of cool little grasses and frozen plants, it doesn't matter, just let your fantasy work, I should say. And on top of it we can use even some highlight color. Little frozen leaves like these make it also realistic, don't overdo it, but just a few will make it happen. And here at the front we can do the same, long grasses little bit more or less or all kinds of stuff was growing there and was frozen in the moment when King Winter hits. Let's take a little break. Howdy guys, you might think what is he doing on that horse? Well, I'm bringing this herd to another farm. Just a short trip, but I have to keep them together. Okay girls, hit him up. Come on horse, let's move those doggies. Oh, I'm okay with everything, as long as you don't start seeing. Keep that in mind, you see this liquor. And what do you think of this trip so far? Oh, it's boring as always. Hey, I got a cool idea. Why don't we start a stampede? You just let shake up the old bones. Okay, cool shoe. Who did stampede? Hey, hey, what's going on? What's happening? Hey, be careful. Now you see that they are stampeding. Now that's gonna be hard to get them back. Well, let's ride like the wind and get them. Oh, ho, ho. Racing is not in my contract, dude. But we can talk about this. I cannot believe I'm bargaining with a horse. But okay, I... Pay you whatever you want. Now let's move. Now we're talking, buddy. Hold on tight. Let's slow down a bit, horsey. It's a cute little town. Hi, lady. Did you see a herd of cows passing by? Yes, cowboy. They run into the mountains. You won't see them back soon. Hey, forget about the cows. We never drink with me in the saloon, okay? Uh, no thank you, sweetie. I really have to get my cows. Maybe next time. i see you soon. Come on, horse. We have to catch up. Oh, uh, well, no. I think I used the wrong perfume this morning. Whew. Okay, horse. We are in the mountains, but I must admit, we are lost. And I got no clue where we are, or even where the cows are. Well, cowboy, my toes are frozen, and I will guarantee you I won't do one more step in this icy mess. Wait a sec. I hear cows. I hear cows. Hey, cowboy, did you move something? What? Who's talking? Oh, well, you better look up, man. Hey, Santa. How is this possible? You found my hurt. Yes, I did. And you know what? I will bring them home. Cows are not built for a walk in the snow. See you soon, buddy. Have a good trip. Hey, Santa, not so fast. Don't leave us alone here. Come on, oh boy. I'm afraid we have to walk back, my friend. Oh, so suddenly I'm your friend, eh? You mean I have to walk back while you are sitting comfortably on my butt? Do we understand each other? Yes, I know it's gonna cost. Oh no, we talking. Let's hit real, buddy. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Let's go home. Mount up, and here we go. I'm a poor lonesome cowboy. Oops, what are you doing? Okay, I told you not to sing, you city slicker. One more time and I will throw you off and you can walk all the way home. Okay, I promise you I won't sing anymore. Very good, cowboy. Because you sound like my auntie Dorothy. 
And what is wrong with you, Auntie Dorothy? She is saying like a horse. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you welcome, cowboy. Hello, cowboy. Just in time for the fireworks. Fireworks? <laughs> I need an eggnog. I'm frozen. Uh, Harry and me? Oh, I need a double eggnog, dude. I think we have a great party, friends. Yeah, let's start the music, ladies. Happy holidays, everybody. Okay, cowboy, let's dance. Come on. Hey, hey, no, but me on your back. Let me go. Come on, let me go. Happy New Year, dudes. Happy New Year. Yeah, party time, but not for us yet. We gotta do the final touch, like highlights on the head and wherever it's necessary. It can be a bit of a challenge as the under layer is dry, because I let the painting dry for a few days, but the blender brush or even your pinky can do miracles to blend it in. The eyes get a bit of burnt sienna left below, and we paint a little highlight on three quarter of the iris, and suddenly he's looking at us. Let's do some after work on the neck hairs. It needs some more dark at the implant but also more highlight on the hairs who are waving in the wind. And these highlights will make it so very interesting. And no, you hardly see me dipping my brush in the paint. And I do that on purpose. During the editing of the show, I cut those moves out of the video because I think it's very annoying when you have a big large screen and you see my big arm or stick going up and down all the time. So no, it's not a magical brush, I told us before. But these episodes are no tutorials. It's just to show you what great things you can do with oil paint. The main part of his back catches the sunlight. So with a highlight tone, we can cover the basic foundation of his butt and his back, but not too heavy. To create a kind of rough skin, we don't make it too solid. And again, this is the magic of painting in layers. The rear leg can have a bit more dark and backlight also. So we give it a second layer, just the same colors, but it looks way much sturdier and stronger. And if necessary, we can do the other legs too. But I think these ones look good. We still have to work on his tail. A few highlights and that's it. And now we're gonna work on the snow under the hooves. With two colors on the fan brush, a dark gray and a light snow color, we let the muddy snow splashing. We have to play with it. There's, there are no exact rules to follow. What might be painful that we need to paint some snow in front of his legs. And then my students ask, why did we paint such beautiful legs if they will be covered anyway? Well, the truth is, if you don't do this, it will look very poor. The legs will shine through it and it looks more convincing and realistic when we put some snow over them. In music terms, we call this kill your own darling, which means you have to sacrifice some things to make other subjects look better. And in this scene, the horse is scrambling to the muddy snow, making an avalanche of mud, snow, stones, and whatever more might fly around. I think this painting is done, and if you have questions, drop me a line. Have fun. It was a challenge to paint a white horse in the white snow, but we did it. Our friend is running and having fun in the cold, cold weather. I hope you liked it. Check out our website. Till the next time and keep on painting.